Good afternoon. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you at the Swiss residence on the occasion of the season launch of the Irish National Opera. One of the works represented will be William Tell by the Italian composer Rossini. In 1291, three Swiss cantons united themselves against the foreign presence in our country. According to the German writer Schiller, the hero of the founding was Wilhelm Tell, who hit with an arrow the apple placed by the foreign governor on the head of his son. I would also like to say some words about the excellent Swiss-Irish relations. In the sixth century, the Irish monk St. Gallus helped to introduce Christianity to Western Europe and founded the Abbey of St. Gallen in Switzerland. Many years later, the famous Irish writer James Joyce was very much at home in Zürich, having lived and died in the city. This year, we are celebrating 100 years of his work Ulysses. While the Irish scientist John Tyndall used to spend his time in the Swiss Alps, Two years ago, we were celebrating his 200th anniversary. Once more, I would like to thank you for your presence at the Swiss residence, and I'm giving the floor to Mr. Fergus Schiel, Artistic Director. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Ambassador and Mrs. Gubler for hosting us here very generously. Uh, it's really exciting to be at the Swiss Embassy. This, uh, the, it's the programming of William Tell which has prompted this get-together between the Irish National Opera and the Swiss community in Ireland and the Swiss Embassy. And it's something we planned to do, of course, in 2020 and weren't able to do. And now it's a dream come true that in 2022, we'll be able to achieve a performance of this monumental opera. And as I came in this morning and I noticed that the, um, the Austrian um, embassy is right next door, I was thinking that in uh, uh, the story of William Tell is about this opposition between the Swiss and the Austrians and the, the freedom fighting between the two, well, the Habsburgs, they were called at the time, but it's uh, uh, um, the same thing, really. And uh, I, it's great to see them peacefully coexisting here on Aylesbury Road and uh, not, not at war with each other. <laughs> so uh, William Tell, of course, is a, um, a Swiss story by an Italian composer composed in French and we will be performing it in French. So I suppose it's very European. Um, and in, for our production of it, we're co collaborating with a Swiss opera company, Nouvelle Opera Fribourg, uh, who are co-producing the opera with us. And the Swiss director, Julien Chavez, is directing and I'm conducting. So it's a kind of a joint Irish-Swiss effort in many ways. And uh, <coughs> William Tell, of course, has not been seen in Ireland since the 1870s. Unbelievable uh, fact. Everybody knows the overture. You may not know, as some of you will know, of course, but some may not know the glories that lie once you turn the page past the overture and you get into the rest of the opera. Uh, it's an absolutely wonderful piece, which I've been so excited about, and uh, we have a fantastic cast. And I suppose here we are, we're in the fifth year of Irish National Opera, um, and uh, we were set up in conjunction with the Arts Council. I'm delighted Maureen Kennelly is here from the Arts Council. She's going to speak to us, because very much we work hand in glove, and we want to try and advance the, the cause of opera in Ireland for everybody's benefit, for the audience, for the artists, for venues, festivals, people around the country, increasingly uh, online and everything like that. But today it's about the nine operas that we're going to present over the next year. And you'll no doubt have this wonderful uh, pullout um, uh, program of events. And I think of these operas in like there's nine operas there. There's three of them that I would categorize like William Tell that they, they, they are very well known and established pieces of the operatic repertoire. 
but for some reason uh, they haven't been seen in Ireland for decades or centuries really, if you, if you say with William Tell. And that would be, as well as William Tell, Rosen Cavalier, last seen in Dublin in 1984, and Verter, last seen here in 1977. So these like, there's huge bits of history to be made. And that's what I, what I find so exciting about my job and, and our company that we can, uh, have these fantastic, phenomenal scores of opera that audiences have not had access to within, you know, within, uh, certainly within my lifetime, I wasn't going to operas in the 1970s and 80s, I'm afraid. Um, uh, so um, these, are, these are sort of virgin territories in a way um, that we're able to go, go down the route of and, and we're able to, to share these with audiences. And then in addition to those three that I've picked, um, three very well-known operas, Tosca, by Puccini, Cusi Fan Tutte, Mozart, and Don Pasquale by, by Donizetti. So we have this combination of things that audiences know and love and, and other operas that audiences may not know as well, and we think that they will love. Um, and, and of those six titles that I've just spoken about, Four of them are done at, at a large scale. So there are two in, in the Gaiety Theatre and two in the Board Gosh Energy Theatre. Um, some of those going on tour as well to Cork, Wexford, Limerick, Galway. Um, and then we have our smaller scale touring productions, which go to a much wider remit. So we, we get to 20 different venues over the course of the next season. And at touring opera is, is one of those, it's, it's incredibly uh, complex. And every time I plan a tour, I say, okay, we're going to do something very small, you know, very small. Uh, and, and I say, well, you know, maybe just a handful of singers. And then maybe, well, well, we'll need a few in the orchestra. And we'll need our costumes and we'll need the... And then all of a sudden, you've got 40 people going on the road. So I've come to the conclusion there is no such thing as small-scale touring for opera. It's all, everything is of a scale. And that's really the joy of it. And that's why we need thing, the support of the Arts Council that we can... We can do these incredible works of, of art. And I suppose I was thinking also about works like the Rosenkavalier and Cusi uh, van Tutte. And why, why are these pieces that were written, you know, Rosenkavalier in 1910, so it's like 110 years old, you know, lots of them earlier than that. Why are works from the 19th, 18th, 19th, early 20th century, why are they still relevant for us today? Is it just about those glorious tunes? Is it just about the orchestration? And I think it's not, it's about the, these works like Rosen Cavalier tells you something much deeper about our own lives, about our own passions. I think people in operas, characters in operas, they have these like large scale things happen to them. Like in Tosca, you know, people get killed and, you know, and, uh, you know, there's major big passions that take place. In Rosen Cavalier, you have this, essentially the story of Rosen Cavalier is uh, a love affair of an older woman and a younger man. And the older woman gets traded in for a younger woman at the end. And that sounds very crass when you put it like that. But actually, the, the huge range of emotions that take you on that journey Tell us so much, I believe, about our own, uh, even if exactly that doesn't happen in our lives, but it tells you so much about the world around you and allows us to, to reflect. And, and the last time, during the, early during the pandemic, when, when uh, we were all looking at things on screens at home, I, I was listening to Rosen Cavalier from the Met um, and with headphones on, really paying attention. And it literally, the music in it would leave you breathless. I literally was, was afraid to take a breath about what was going to come next, even though I knew what was going to come next. Um, but uh, so I, I think these, these, uh, these operas, they project huge sort of passions and emotions and, and, and they, they help us understand ourselves. Well, that's what I find anyway. It helps me understand myself and I hope it's the same for, for, for other people. And then of course you have the, the comic, comic operas like Don Pasquale, which is so wonderful and funny. And, and some people describe it as a, as a cruel opera because it's, um, it's, it's sort of elder abuse, if you like, you know, a young couple making fun of the, the old guy with the money. And, and, uh, um, but actually, you know, it's all about that kind of, and it's very similar to Rosen Cavalier. It's all about understanding where you are in life and how you relate to people of different ages and different backgrounds and uh, how, you know, 
young people coming up have their day and, and, and old people may have their money, but they're not going to have, uh, they're not going to have the love uh, that, that the younger couple have. Um, so th- th- just fantastic things like that. Cousy van Tutte as well, Mozart, it's of course um, very uh, controversial in many ways because, you know, people, people wonder, is it a sexist opera? Is it, is it suggesting that the women are weak and the men are strong? And I don't see it at all that way. I see it's four young people who, who need to learn about love. And, uh, in, in, and an older two characters, in, um, uh, they don't necessarily, Despina doesn't necessarily need to be older. She could be of any age, but Don Alfonso is older. And, uh, um, and these characters really teach a lesson about what love is. Um, I, I, it, love is idealistic and it is passionate, but it's also, we're all humans and we all fail in, in, in everything. Um, and, and I think, you know, hundreds of years later, those lessons are so relevant and, and so um, pertinent to us. So that's why I'm so excited about these operas and maybe sort of people ask me, how do you choose There's so many operas? How do you choose? And, and I choose partly by trying to have that balance between things that are very popular and well-loved with repertoire we haven't seen. And then also a key part of what we do is, particularly in Irish National Opera, I think we do this more than other opera companies that I've seen, is that we try to match the repertoire to the voices we have available. So many of you will be familiar with all the fantastic Irish singers that exist. So I sit down regularly with uh, people uh, like Anna Devon, who you're going to meet a little bit later, or with Paula Murray or Celine Byrne or uh, Claudia Boyle or Tara Rock, all these great singers. And I chart out with them a whole path of what they would like to do over the next few years. And I weave this into a program that I think will work because I want them to be doing the roles that they feel they are at their peak in. Um, Nothing more so than Maria Stuarda, which we're going to see in a few weeks' time, uh, which is the end of this season, uh, where we have two phenomenal performances from uh, Tara Aracht and from Anna Devon. So um, that's a little window into, I suppose, how I would go about thinking. Um, I would also say, of course, that one of the hallmarks, one of the things we do slightly differently from some opera companies is that we are really committed to generating new operas as well. And we've done that right from the word go. And we did it, of course, during the pandemic with our 20 shots of opera. But we had been doing it long before that, and we will continue to do it. And in this season that we're announcing today, we have three uh, major works that we're involved with. One of them, The First Child by Dunica Dennehy and Enda Walsh. Uh, which is uh, the end of a triptych of three operas that uh, it feels like literally it's it's been about 10 years working on these operas. Uh, And it has been uh, since 2012, uh, working on on the three operas, the, The Last Hotel, The Second Violinist and The First Child, all of them dealing with the kind of the, the, what lies beneath the, the sort of the glitzy surface of contemporary life. You know, these people with wonderful suburban lives and uh, gorgeous apartments and uh, American fridges and everything, everything perfect. But but actually that there's beneath them all, there's a darkness. And again, I don't think, I hope that nobody in the room is as dark as some of the characters in an Andrew Walsh uh, play. But, but, you know, we all have these elements within us that, uh, and operas like that can speak very powerfully to, to you, uh, I think. Uh, really excited that uh, uh, one of the first operas we commissioned, uh, at least like the other, the story of Rosemary Kennedy, written by Brian Irvine and Nisha Jones. Very excited that that's going to the Royal Opera House next year. Our second opera at the Royal Opera House, having done Vivaldi's Bajazet uh, earlier this year. And we hope it'll be uh, an ongoing relationship with the Royal Opera House uh, I'm really excited because I think it's such a powerful piece that deals with so many contemporary issues. Um, it's the story of Rosemary Kennedy, and uh, um, many of you have, may have seen it when it was here. Um, and if you haven't seen it, you need to go to London and see it because it's just a, a stunning piece. And lastly, our a, a, another project that we've worked on for many years, the um, virtual reality community opera Out of the Ordinary, which has been the product of a really intense period of working with communities in rural Ireland, in Inishman, in Tala, South Dublin, 
bringing communities together, people who don't normally take part in the creation of opera, and giving them a chance to see what it's like to write an opera with a fantastic uh, creative team headed by Joe Mangan, the director, and Fanola Merivale, the composer. So there's so much to enjoy. I hope that's given you a little bit of a glimpse. Um, there's so many phenomenal singers in the season ahead, as well as some of the people I've mentioned who will be returning to us. We have a few names that are new to INO that I'm very excited about. Magella Culler making her first appearance with us, Robin Trichler, uh, Sarah Brady, a phenomenal uh, young soprano who's doing great things in Switzerland and Germany now. Uh, she's going to come home to perform for us as well. So there's so much talent on, on these stages, on so many, 20 different stages. Uh, so there's so much to enjoy. And Diego is going to speak to you a little bit later and take us beyond, in a way, beyond those nine productions to, to let you know some of the other things that are happening in the company. Um, and, but one of the things I would just say that in, as we've developed and grown and our output has expanded, again, I would, that, that's as a result of increased support from the Arts Council, that we, would, um, we have uh, managed to put our chorus now on a retainer. They're engaged for 26 weeks of the year. So they have half-time contracts. Our orchestra we're developing on our own. So developments like this really add to the infrastructure of the country. And having skilled people working like that has all sorts of ripple effects beyond the nine operas that we will uh, present. Uh, in education and working with young people. The, the, these singers, these instrumentalists, they have very rich lives centered around Irish National Opera, but not uh, restricted to, to Irish National Opera. So the development of this company is such a, such a major part of the entire ecology of opera and, and classical music in Ireland. And also, I would uh, say theater. We, we work so much with theater artists uh, as well. Um, so that's great. I'm, I'm going to stop talking now. Um, uh, I could bore you for another half an hour if you wanted it, but uh, I think that's enough to whet your appetite. And I'm going to introduce our first performance. We're going to hear the wonderful uh, soprano Kellyanne Masterson now. And Kellyanne uh, is going to sing the role of Norina in Don Pasquale. So I asked her if she would sing an aria from it. And she's going to sing the opening aria where we meet Norina for the first time, Quel Guardo il Cavaliere. Like many Italian operas, the aria is in two parts, what we call the cavatina, which is the first lyrical part, and then the more lively, upbeat second part, which is referred to as the cavaletta. Um, if you didn't know those terms, you'll be able to spring them on your friends. Oh, that was very interesting, cavaletta there. Um, and the cavatina, the first section, is the first time she sings in the opera. She's reading a book. The book is telling a love story. And then, then she closes the book, laughs, and says, that's baloney, that's nonsense. If you want to look, if you want love, all I have to do is look at you. I have to just, you know, raise my eyebrow or give you a little glance, and everybody will fall in love with me. And that's kind of what happens during the opera. So uh, she uses her power of love. Um, for great uh, gain. So let's welcome uh, Kellyanne Masterson with Aoife O'Sullivan, who's going to play the piano. Thank you.
Thank you so much to Kellyanne and bravo. That's a taste of what's to come. Uh, I'd now like to welcome Maureen Kennelly, Director of the Arts Council. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Ambassador Goobler and your family, and to friends and colleagues, it's a really, really great pleasure to be here this afternoon uh, on this occasion of a joyous looking forward. And I'm delighted to be joined here by my colleague, Niall Doyle, Head of Music and Opera. So we're very, very pleased to be here on behalf of the Arts Council this afternoon. And thank you, Ambassador, for your very generous hosting of us all this afternoon. 
it's only a few, a very few years ago that after, after a very particularly difficult decade for opera in Ireland, that Irish National Opera was established. So it's absolutely striking to reflect that really this is the fifth year of Irish National Opera. And after what I suppose we would acknowledge was a somewhat bleak period in a long and rich Irish operatic history, it was a moment of significant hope for opera, but it was also, of course, one that was accompanied by great challenge and risk. And opera, because of its multidisciplinary approach and the collaborative complexity of it, is one of the most difficult arts in which to achieve real excellence, as many of us here in the room know. But when it succeeds, it's one that also makes an astonishingly powerful multi-sensory impact. And I'm reflecting back on it in thinking about today, I was looking back through many of the interviews that Michael Durbin has so nicely put together for INO and for, for your programmes. And Edwina Casey, the director, was reflecting on her first time experiencing opera, watching Madame Butter Butterfly at the age of 15, and how it absolutely transported her, and how you know she simply did not understand the effect that it had on her, and how much it stayed with her. And I'm sure all of us here could recount many similar experiences. And when I think myself of INO's work, the words visceral and mesmerizing and transporting are the ones that readily spring into my mind. So back when uh, the Arts Council made this decision to, to create a new force for opera, two small companies came together and formed INO back in 2018. And there was indeed great hope and great goodwill. And of course, there was a very high air of expectation about what was to come. But those expectations are always tempered by the practical and profession, pro professional realities of opera making. And of course, being a new company, there were very particular challenges facing it. So they began with very small budgets. There was no rehearsal or performance venue. There was no orchestra, chorus, nor many of the other things that most professional opera companies in the world, and certainly national opera companies, would come to expect and take for granted. Fulfilling its admirably high ambition to be a truly national company of international excellence and a standard bearer for Irish opera artists was always going to be a very great challenge. And as we all know and acknowledge readily here in the room, the results have been truly remarkable. INO has shown a truly remarkable dedication to its core ambition, and it's been hugely imaginative, enterprising, flexible, and innovative in how it's gone about its mission. And it's just so exciting, Fergus, to hear you talk, to give us that tantalizing glimpse into the, the nine forthcoming operas. You've produced several new remarkable Irish operas, stunning Irish productions of classic repertoire, and most thrillingly, I think for me, new ways of engaging diverse communities and individuals with opera. INO is a truly national company in its public reach. You're bringing great opera to all parts of the country, and you, you continue very imaginatively to use broadcast, film, internet, and other technologies to extend that reach further. And earlier this year, the Arts Council launched its new spatial policy in <laughs> Carlo. And really the thrust of that spatial policy is to ensure that everybody in every part of Ireland can have access, can participate, engage with, uh, and enjoy all the art forms, and INO is an exemplar in helping us to achieve that policy. You're providing significant employment for more and more Irish opera artists, and you're developing and providing platforms for emerging operatic talent. And it's great to hear you talk about the names that we were all familiar with, but to talk too about the new names that you'll bring forward in the new season. So it's a source of an enormous pride to reflect on the change landscape, because truly you have and you are changing the landscape in terms of what's available for Irish operatic talent. And as I go about the role that I am privileged to have, I'm encountering artists across all art forms, and they're talking about I and O, and I know then that the reach is absolutely enormous. So it's wonderful to, to know that there are artists like Tom Creed here today, Joe Mangan, Jessica Trainer, so many <coughs> others who come from other art forms traditionally and are engaging with opera in such a, a brilliant way. Um, in looking back through those interviews uh, in the programmes, I was struck by a few uh, particular lines. They're really fantastic interviews, which I'd, I'd encourage you to read if you haven't. Uh, Fergus himself speaks of a combination of exhilaration and terror at his first engagement at the tender age of 25, and indeed talked about how uh, comforted he was by Magella Cola, I think, on that first outing. <laughs> 
Um, I loved what Naomi Louisa O'Connell had to say uh, in terms of knowing that she was tripping up and saying, I was getting in my own way. Uh, Giselle Allen talked about uh, her feeling that most opera singers are normal people like me. And Orla Boylan remarked, we're part of a working industry. There's no room to be a diva. And it's that sense of groundedness and earthiness and clear purpose that is so winning about Irish National Opera that I really salute you um, for showing and for continuing to show. And of course, we all know we've been through an enormously disruptive period because of COVID. And in, throughout that period, INO showed dynamic and imaginative leadership and huge artistic flair. Its 20 shots of opera was a highlight that rightly brought the company and a huge number of Irish creative artists to national and international acclaim. And now as we're emerging happily from COVID, we've recently seen the return of large scale opera and large audiences in Dublin and smaller scale touring opera. And Fergus mentioned Baja Zet, and I had, uh, I think myself and my colleagues were almost indecently proud to see it in the Royal Opera House in January. It was just absolutely stunning. And that perfectly encapsulates the collaborative excellence, ambition, and imagination which has become INO's hallmark. A neglected Vivaldi opera that began its co-production life earlier this year, rehearsed in Dublin, premiered in Navan, toured Ireland, and then finished with the history-making run at the Royal Opera House, and very importantly, with the support of our friends in Culture Ireland. And of course, as we know, <clears throat> it was packed with operatic talent on and off the stage. And it really was so gratifying to see the powerful impact that it made on audiences here and in London, and of course, picking up those nominations and the Olivia Award and the outstanding the Achievement Award going to Peter Whelan and to our part, to INO's partners, the Irish Baroque or Orchestra. And we often, uh, poets often talk about poems coming through them, but to see Peter Whelan that night was to see music coming through him, radiating outwards to the players and onwards to us, the audience. It was a truly transcendent experience. But of course, outstanding achievement is something that we've come to associate readily with INO. And hearing you talk, Fergus, about the 2022 and 23 season, I've no doubt that our, our expectations will be more than satisfied. So you've grand operatic spectacle down to finely polished chamber scale opera, new work, and a dazzling array of Irish and international artists. And I know we'll all have personal highlights. Um, I've been hearing so much about Brian Irvin and Nisha Jones, least like the other, which I missed on the first outing, but I'll certainly be sure not to miss it when, when it makes an impression, as I know it will, in London in January. And I can't wait to see the virtual reality opera that Joe Mangan and her colleagues are magically you know, up, and of course, William Tell. But so many, so many highlights to look forward to, and stunning to think about 20 different stages. That, that is real, real success. So everything that you're doing is a key part of what we believe makes a truly fantastic national opera company. And we in the council particularly look forward to continuing our partnership with you to, to bring this about. So I want to finish by congratulating Fergus, Diego, all the very, very talented team at INO for thanking your board. I know how much time that you give to this voluntarily and that's very much acknowledged and appreciated by everybody at the Arts Council. And I want to thank the great artists who have made this such an exciting enterprise. I'm so incredibly proud of all you do. I know in the room here this afternoon, there are many other supporters of INO, and it's absolutely vital that you continue to support. And there are members of the media as well. And I'd like to thank you for the continued support and encouragement that you give to INO. So thank you to the musicians here this afternoon. Thanks once again, Ambassador. And I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maureen. Uh, thank you for launching our season today. Um, it was really gratifying to hear those words. Um, thank you also to Niall for, for your encouragement and support. Um, we, of course, think that the Arts Council investing money in the opera is a very good idea, and we hope you will continue to do so. But also, uh, over the years, you've given us increases, and every time you've given us an increase in the grant, we have delivered more. And so we hope that you also see what we do as really good value for money. 
and not just good value, but also good quality. So thank you very much. And also, um, I am so happy to see so many of our supporters here today. Um, first of all, because it's good to have friendly faces in the audience, uh, but also because it shows me that, that you really care about us and you're here to find out what we're doing this season, even though you could have stayed at home, watched it online, or gone onto our website. So thank you for being here. Your financial investment in a company means that we can do more than we would normally do, so thank you. Please keep investing. And also it gives us ammunition to go to the Arts Council and say, see, we have all these supporters who want to support us. Give us more money, we'll do even more than what we're doing. Um, we, as, as Fergus alluded to, I mean, obviously the, 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 the nine productions that we have over the next 12 months is, is a huge achievement. It's a lot of work. Uh, but there's a lot more that we do behind the scenes that may not be as visible as the productions that we put on. Um, what we want to do is really uh, create a viable opera ecology in Ireland. So that means we want people, artists, singers, musicians, directors, designers, to be able to make a living by working here in Ireland and abroad and in other places. But we also want to cultivate audiences. We want to cultivate the next generation of audiences and the next generation of artists as well. Um, and I think we've made a real impact on, on the opera ecology. I mean, I, I, I can practically feel it, that, that there's been a big change from five years ago to today. Um, we do this through a number of initiatives and projects. We have our opera studio, which is our professional development program for emerging artists. Uh, we accept singers, directors, conductors, uh, repetiteurs, and also composers. And um, just to, to show you kind of the success of, of this program, um, Kellyanne Masterson, who you heard before, um, she was in our uh, opera studio program. She's now working with us professionally. Uh, Elaine Kelly, who is sitting at the back there, she came to our opera studio program. She worked on many of our productions as assistant conductor or as chorus master. She's now our resident conductor, and she made her conducting debut with us last December in Cork, and there will be more conducting engagements uh, that she will do. Uh, Amy Niari, who will sing, who she was uh, in our studio the very first year of the program, she will now sing the character in Least Like the Other, Searching for Rosemary Kennedy at the Royal Opera House in January. So that will be an amazing opportunity for her. Um, in addition to developing uh, artists, we also, of course, want to develop audiences. And we have an extensive education outreach program. We work with a number of schools, a number of communities. Next month, we will do our, our first ever uh, youth opera called Horse, Ape, Bird. Um, so it's all very exciting. And we continue to invest in reaching out to as many sectors of the society as we possibly can, and all through the country, uh, not just in Dublin. Um, we also reach audiences, of course, through by recording our operas uh, for radio broadcast on uh, RTE Lyric or on the BBC. Um, and also by releasing albums. So we now have a contract with Signum Records and we've released two albums, um, uh, Alice's Adventures Underground and La Boheme. So there'll be more CDs coming out. And the, and the function of these CDs, of course, in the case of a new opera, is to ensure that other people around the world will listen to it and hear it. And in the case of La Boheme, is we want people to know that Celine Byrne is one of the best poems around. So this, this will help you know, sp spread the word uh, about Irish artists internationally. The films that we made during lockdown, those, we can, those will remain. They, 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 they will remain as a, as, a, as a piece of artwork that we continue to roll out. Um, the, in, in March, we premiered um, Scorched Earth Trilogy, uh, a co-production with Dumb World. That work will be shown next week, I think, in Rotterdam as part of the O Festival. And also, they will be showing eight of the 20 shots as part of the festival throughout the city. So all the work that we have put into the last two years in making films, in making online content, all of that will live on and, and, and we will continue to use and we can use it to further our name to um, advance the reputation of Irish opera artists as well as 
our own reputation of Irish National Opera, which I think, you know, the Olivia Award was, was, was a huge moment for us. I mean, just, just being able to hear Fiona Shaw read out the name Irish National Opera in the Royal Albert Hall was exciting. Um, so um, that was great. So we have more work to do now. Um, and also, there, there's a number of actions that might not be visible uh, at all to people, like, like ripple effects that Fergus talked about. So for example, um, Anna Brennan, who is one of the composers of the 20 Shots of Opera, direct, as a direct result of having composed one of those, she got a commission to write a new piece for the Brigands Festival because an artistic director somewhere saw it online and recommended her. And by coincidence, uh, uh, the Cho Cho San for the Madama Butterfly production in Brigands will be Celine Byrne because their casting director came to Cork to see Celine Byrne in Madama in Madame Butterfly and then she got cast. So it's a long way of saying um, what we do is great for our audiences. We hope you keep liking our productions. It's also great for the artists and we will continue to kind of fly the flag for Irish opera and for Irish opera artists. And I am very happy to be able to introduce you now to a fantastic soprano, Anna Devon. Um, you will remember her from, uh, well, she sang in our inaugural concert, uh, The Big Bang. She sang the uh, Juliet's aria. Uh, she was Pamina in our Magic Flute. Last year, she was our Musetta in La Boheme. Currently, she's rehearsing, I'm looking at Tom Creed, the director, she's rehearsing in uh, Maria Stuarda by Zoni Zetti which will be on in the Gaiety from the 5th of June. She and Tara Erhardt, uh uh, play the two queens. And, you know, having Tara Erhoft and, and Anna Devon uh, in the same cast is the kind of casting that any opera house in the world would love to have. Um, and we are, of course, very happy that she's back with us next season singing Fior de Ligi in Così Fan Tutte. She will sing for us the aria Come Scoglio. Uh, at this point in the opera, Fior de Ligi and Dora Bella's fiancés have pretended to have gone off to war and come back in disguise to try to woo each other's girlfriend. When they approach for the Ligi trying to flirt with her, she is absolutely horrified. And she rebuffs their advances in no uncertain terms and says, like a rock, I will stand firm against wind and tempest. And only death will, will, will change the affections of my heart. So please welcome Anna Devin, Ivo Sullivan on piano, come scoglio from Così fan tutte. Thank you. 
Thank you, Anna. That was fantastic. I loved it, Aria. Um, and thank you, Aoife, as well. So um, we're coming to the end of our proceedings. Just a few thanks, first of all, to the Irish National Opera team. Um, thank you to all of my colleagues for making today happen. There was a lot of work that went into not just this event, not just the brochure, but that happens all the time. We are growing as a company. We'll need to engage more staff very soon, which we will do. So we really appreciate all of the teamwork that goes on at 69 Dame Street. Um, thank you also to our board, uh, represented here today by our chair, Jennifer Caldwell. There she is. And Jared Howlin is here as well. We, we have a board meeting tonight, in fact, and I think it's number, it's number 39. It's, it, because we're a new company, we have to have a lot more meetings than a company normally would in year one and year two. And then because of COVID, we had to keep meeting almost every month because the budget kept changing every month. Um, so thank you for your support and guidance. We really appreciate it. And thank you to the Swiss Embassy, the Swiss Ambassador, uh, and to Dear Rizwini, who helped us organize the event today. We really appreciate your hospitality. I hope all of you will join us for some refreshments next door. Um, I'll just say a few words in the ambassador's native tongue. Danke vielmals, dass wir hier können bei euch heute uh, unsere neue Saison bekannt gehen. Um, wir sind sehr dankbar und froh. And that was Swiss German, in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> and that neatly introduces our final uh, musical piece, which is the March of the Swiss Soldiers, also known as the Gallop from William Tell's Overture by Rossini. And to play it for us, we will have Eva Sullivan with our artistic director, Fergus Sheehan. <laughs> 